Gatwick Airport one Monday in September. British Caledonian flight BR-895 from Paris is down safely, three minutes ahead of schedule. Weather clear, temperature on the ground 15 degrees centigrade. Four hours from now, this aircraft will make its last routine flight of the day, an 80-minute journey north. But it'll carry no passengers. There'll be no cabin crew, no baggage, and no seats. aircraft is now flight BR957, destination Edinburgh, cargo, mail. Every night the Edinburgh mail flight carries 11 tonnes of first class letters from London destined for homes all over Scotland, the new night mail. Altimeter, Aircraft are only one part of the system that every day delivers Britain's mail. Letters posted earlier in the day have, since mid-afternoon, been on their way north by train. The post office relies on both. Trains to pick up the mail and often to sort it as they travel. Aircraft, quite simply, for speed. Glasgow, 7 a.m. Letters from England are dropping onto doormats all over the city. But the job isn't as simple as that. For from Glasgow, much of the mail must go on, beyond the tight-packed city streets. Far from the magnets of city and capital, the pull of money, the gold-seamed runways, the sweat and tears of machinery, far from all crowds, across the blank pane of the Atlantic, we come to these islands, the loosened edges of a nation, their bits and pieces scattered like iron filings, their hills heaped up like slaughtered horses, their rocky outcrops like jawbones clenched against the wind. Here, highland cattle drink from their own shadows. Here, thistles flash their spiky coronets. Here, children and grannies live among nooks and crannies. And like a splash of blood against the land's anemia, a rush and flush of excitement, spreading the word where words are hoarded, the red post van comes threading its way to meet the mail plane. That pair of scales balancing in the sky, that winged insect, delicate and clumsy as a dragonfly, which drops in like a friend each morning, kissing with its wheels and its hatch of post bags the upturned face of the earth. But on an average day, coming in on the aircraft, we have maybe three bags of, of air mail. Whereas uh, on Christmas week, we can have anything up to 14 bags of mail coming in, so that we have quite a lot of work to do at that period. Yet, even in Christmas week, the post office is hard put to show a profit on the island of Barra. The same story is repeated in any number of remote communities around the country. But by a canny piece of thinking, they've discovered a way to make the postman's delivery van pay for itself by turning it into a bus. Uh, 
At a time when rural bus services are disappearing, the invention of the post bus is also a sublime piece of public relations. Oh, it's very important because it's the only form of uh, public transport on the island. There are no buses or that, you know, at regular intervals. So everybody makes use of the post bus from when it leaves Castlebay right down to Elligary and right down the other side of the island. And it covers the whole island. And it's uh, ideal for people who haven't got their own transport. It's a very trusted member of the community, the postman. There's more to it than postman, there's news and whatnot, and what's happening and what's not happening, you're able to find us out from them. You do look forward to seeing the postman. It's a very sort of welcome sight. You get the news, you get mail if you're lucky. You also get bills, which you have to attend when you're not so lucky. <laughs> Fifty years ago, you'd probably have heard much the same thing. Ah, hello. But one thing that has changed is the huge growth in mail order. Countrywide, it's now a £500 million annual business for the post office. For the customer on Barra, it's often a lifeline. Before now, I've been able to go away about twice a year. But um, since we've had the children now, it's not so easy to go away. And there's no pleasure in going shopping with two young children. It's much easier by catalogue. You can get anything for, for your granny right down to a baby. And toys for the children, it's very important, I think, for the children when it comes to Christmas time. Oh. It's not so bad in the summertime doing it, but uh, when the, it gets dark here around about four o'clock in the afternoon in the winter time, so it can be quite dark when you're delivering the mail. So you have two things to cope with, the darkness plus the dogs. <laughs> The dogs are bad news. Night mail moves 42 million letters every 24 hours. Around about five o'clock every afternoon, 100,000 idle letterboxes suddenly begin to fill up, and postmen in 28,000 vans struggle through rush hour traffic to empty them. Our letter posting habits could hardly make the job more difficult. Any single letter could be destined for any one of 23 million postal addresses in the United Kingdom. The first task is to concentrate the mail in sorting offices. They've become vast letter factories which run 24 hours a day. Only by postponing the handling of second class mail can the post office keep the workload evenly spread, and the evening congestion down to manageable proportions. Night shift work is well paid and good for the pension. So many of the night sorters are older postmen who've served their time on the streets and come in out of the cold. I think I was born a postman. Somebody's got to be a postman, haven't they? If you didn't like the job, you wouldn't stop in it 26, 27, 28 years, would you? If my boy was leaving school now at 15, there's no way he could say, I'm going to be in the post office 30 years like I'd be. No, because the job won't be there. It'll all be machines. Machines. The key to mechanised sorting is coding. Operators translate the postcode into a string of blue dots, which can be read by machine. No one has yet invented a machine to read human handwriting. But coding machines which read printed addresses already exist. Just one can do the work of 18 human operators. 
The only job the machines had to do was walk up and down the garden path, that's all. Seven o'clock, and 80 feet underground, the post office railway is working flat out. It shifts mail between six London sorting offices and the mainline stations at Paddington and Liverpool Street. One third of the nation's mail crosses London. A third of that, 40,000 bags a day, travels through these seven miles of tunnels. Well, I, I love the idea of the trains, yes. I, I, just, I rather like uh, the feel of it, you know, down with you know, the trains and everything. I think uh, it's interesting, you know. It's like having your own big toy train set, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, one, two, three, no. You've got uh, 18 in 14's time. Small section really, haven't we, you know? About 100 men and uh, got a big family and all thing, you know. Oh, I think there's a lot of camaraderie down here, you know, everyone seems to stick together. Obviously, we think we're better than the ones upstairs, you know what I mean? So. We're always waiting for above ground or we're waiting for them at the top of the lift in or whatever. Very few occasions they're waiting for us. You know, we're pretty fast service. We're only really used to this side of the operation. Railway. Uh, if you asked me to sort a letter, I wouldn't have a clue. Uh, It takes only 15 minutes to get mail right across London. In the streets above, traffic crawls at a pace no faster than the horse-drawn carriages which were about when the first tunnel was driven in 1914. Some of the locos have been running since 1933. Many have clocked up a million and a quarter miles. Eight fifteen, Newcastle Station. The North East Travelling Post Office, or TPO, takes on the last of its mail. It's one of forty TPOs that cross the country every night. Tonight, this is the UP, heading towards London. The bright red livery marks it out as the flagship of the TPO fleet. Two. Northeast TV or three. The crew work an eight-hour shift without a meal break five nights a week. And in the course of that week, they see their families twice for just a few hours. It takes a special type of man. I've tried to figure it out, and we've got young fellas, we've got old guys, we've got married people, we've got single blokes. And I kind of put my finger on what a TPO type of fella is, but it must be a TPO type, because we're all volunteers and we'll stick it for years and years and years. Your sure is one. I think the TPO type is, uh, you've got to be a bit of a cowboy and be prepared to live out of a bog and away from home. I think it's the children really it affects more than anything else. If you've got young children, then they're safe. Mine wants another daddy so she can uh, send him to work and keep me at home. Are you E13 away time? Yes. Oh, I have three days. <laughs> Eight twenty-two. First stop: Durham, then Darlington, York, Pontefract, Sheffield, Derby, Bedford, Luton, and St Pancras. Coming down from St Pancras, we specialise on Yorkshire, County Durham, and Northumberland, and going back up again the other way towards St Pancras, we specialise on counties that's south of Derby. We've then got certain post office services built into our arrival time. I mean, we've got to rely on vans arriving from different places to our route to take the work back again. But the network's built around us. And to the other TV years, of course. Fathers and grandfathers of these men were crewing TPOs in the year that Grierson's classic documentary Nightmail was made. If they were lucky enough to be in work, that is. If not, they might have been marching from Jarrow. Some things don't change. 
But in a steady, regular job with a steady, regular wage. Means a lot to me when I've got two brothers on the door. Means a lot to me. Well, I've got two brothers in laws on the door and a brother. I mean, I, work, I live in an old mining village and there's just a lot of people just kind of getting work, you know, they're all old miners and this is nothing there for them. When I first joined the post office, without a word of a lie, if you walked past the entrance to the post office, there was a bloke sitting on the door and he used to come up and say, do you want a job, son? And it was that easy. No, you can't get a job. <laughs> One hundred and fifty miles away at Derby, the locomotive that will haul the North East Up TPO on the final leg of its journey is the centre of attention. Fifty years after the Grierson film celebrating its night mail operation, the post office have got together with British Rail to mark the event. Do the honours here and name the train night mail. The catching and dispatching equipment, the apparatus as it was known, has long since disappeared. The men who had to work it were glad to see the back of it. When the poachers come in, they did come in. I mean, if they hit you, they would have killed you. Yeah, simple as that. It was dirty, it was oily, it was greasy, and it was very heavy work. Especially when in the winter when you had to open those doors. And you have every door open on that train and it's bent along at say 70, 80 mile an hour. And the snow's coming in, the smoke off the engine's coming in and it used to be terrible. We used to tie mailbags around the legs, we used to put mailbags on the floor to stand on, just to stop the cold from actually coming up. From 9.30, Derby Station virtually stops passenger operations to cope with the nightmare. Between now and midnight, nine different postal trains will arrive. They will exchange locomotives, mail, vans, staff and gossip. The fate of a million letters depends on Derby's shunting system. 1M58, which is the 2005 from Peterborough to Crewe, arrives in platform two. The locomotive is uncoupled. One M36 is booked to arrive train, into platform one at 23:37. And this at train north end normally attach ten vehicles, which has previously arrived off one M77 from Lincoln. They are attached to what is now the rear of the Peterborough train. We have Destined the arrival into platform away three of one P30 the 2035 from St Pancras to Derby. This train conveys three vehicles. The first vehicle and the locomotive are for Leeds, and the rear two vehicles are for Derby. Ten thirty, East Midlands Airport, just outside Derby. Every few minutes, aircraft full of mail touch down between 15 and 20 on a normal night. They're stripped of their cargo, reloaded and sent on their way. It's known as a hub-and-spoke operation. From here, the spokes radiate out north to Inverness, Aberdeen and Glasgow, west to Liverpool and Belfast, east to Norwich, south to London and a string of airports between Newquay and Southend. Flights are timed to connect with the postal trains on Derby Station and with a fleet of road vehicles from nearby towns, Leicester, Coventry, Birmingham, Doncaster, Nottingham and Leeds. This is the heart of the night mail operation. It all has to gel together. Uh, you've got three modes of transport, road, rail and air, and if any one of them is out of synchronization, it puts the other two uh, into, into great difficulties. Trains can be delayed, uh, aeroplanes can be cancelled because of weather conditions, vans can break down, so there are contingency plans for every single thing that can go wrong. But it's a very time-critical operation. Five minutes can make all the difference. The northeast up is five minutes away. From Derby, it'll be another two and a half hours non-stop sorting into St Pancras. Then, a meal, sleep, and a few hours to kill with the rest of the lads. You get not little individual teams, but you get clicks within the whole team. 
I mean, we go playing squash, we go drinking beer. There's people knock around at weekends together that work together all the week. I mean, some lads go to the pitches. It all depends what your interest is, you know. It's, uh, but we're going squashing tomorrow. It's approaching midnight. For a moment, for the post office, Derby is the hub of the universe. At 0010, we have the up postal arriving to platform six from Newcastle. This is 1M59, the 2022 Newcastle to St Pancras. This train is a very heavy mail carrier uh, with very tight connections from East Midlands Airport. Platform 4 at 0020, we have 1E04, which is the down postal from St Pancras to the the long platform spoking outwards from the hub of England, away from where we lie coupling and uncoupling, the unseen industry goes on, the nightmare. Work as it sounds still done by men, most of it. The porters with their mule packs, the sorters at their boxes like bees in a hive or doves in a dovecot. The trolleys skidaddling so that no connection shall ever be missed. Then the dark flickers with the flare of machines, planes moving blindly down the empty air lanes, vans along B roads lit by rabbit's eyes and cat's eyes, trains through cuttings of fennel and elderflower. And like a steamed up windscreen, slowly clearing, we come out in the glare of morning to this gray mill town lying under a duvet, its shuttle stopped, its industrial vase is empty, a town sleeping in, now there's nothing to get up for, where the streets at dawn used to clatter with the clogs of workers, but are hushed now under the sole tread of the postman, shouldering his burden, more laden by the year, his bag heavy with nuisance mail and useless mail, with offers of free films and ads for double glazing, with flyers for tool hire and commons to try us or buy us, a slag heap of bump or summons us to pay, not what they want here. A bond come up, a job come up, a bigger gyro check. Yet still the heart quickens at the click of the letter flap, the thud on the mat, all of us hunting the authentic handwritten envelope. The letters from pen friends or men friends, the letters from mothers or brothers or lovers, and the hope of that makes the sound of the postman our favorite bird song, his arm reaching to our letterbox, like these trains stretched out along embankments, not juggity jug now, but smooth with power and self importance, like flags or streamers blowing ahead of themselves, as we ourselves run on toward the future, its unopened envelope waiting down the line. 